Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. This is Kim Skorupski. On today's episode, I'm so happy that we have my friend and colleague, Dr. Netta Gould. Dr. Netta is an assistant professor and the director of the mindfulness program at Johns Hopkins, the associate director of the Bayview Anxiety Disorders Clinic in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Good morning, Netta. Good morning, Kim. Thank you for having me. Well, this is just a you know really uh, interesting times we're in, and so I just thought, who can I call on who has the uncanny and exceptional ability to make people feel calm and relaxed and centered? I know, Netta Gould, because I took your mindfulness-based <laughs> stress reduction course, and so who better than you to help us navigate through these really uncertain waters? What can you share with the faculty and staff and anyone listening um, during this really challenging time? Sure. Well, it, it is a challenging time, and I think part of what's so challenging is the uncertainty of what's happening, and we are not used to having times be so uncertain, and that's uh, unsettling for us. And also, not to mention the the disruption. You know, everyone's been affected in some capacity. But you know, as a mindfulness instructor, there are things that we can do. And I think that you know, what other option do we have in this moment than to uh, bring ourselves to the present moment and and be with it in some capacity, and at the same time plan. Um, The mindfulness, I think, can be very useful in allowing us to clear our minds so that we can make better decisions and see things a little bit more clearly and also to allow us to um, plan for the future. So ironically, people think that when I practice mindfulness, well, I'm not going to be able to think into the future or plan, but it's actually the opposite, that when we're mindful, we can um, see things and more clearly and plan. And so I think that it's a, a really important uh, tool to, to use in these moments. Mm-hmm. The, I remember taking your class and when I've been sitting home yesterday, well, half a day yesterday, I finally came home and, and um, they kicked us out of the building and had CNN and MSNBC and Fox and like running between all these channels you do get sucked into that. And I start feeling myself getting a little bit um, anxious and then more, my breathing mm-hmm. gets more rapid. And I think, okay, Netta Gould, Netta Gould, what did you tell us? <laughs> we, we start every class with our breathing. And so I literally turned the TV off and I said, this is ridiculous. I can't get sucked into this and started breathing. And it really immediately calmed me down. Oh, that's, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I'm in the same boat. So I've been really trying to limit my access to, to everything. I think it's really important to stay informed. But with the constant barrage of information coming at us, it, it's uh, it's overwhelming and it would make anyone feel anxious. So I think it is important to limit our access to that in some way, maybe listen to it in the morning or in the evening from a couple of reliable sources. And then the rest of the day, I think it's really important to try to create a sense of normalcy to the extent that we can, and that's going to look different for, for everybody. Um, the, and, and I think exactly what you did is, is what I would recommend that we pause. And even if it's for a few minutes, you do some sort of activity to center yourself. And that might be uh, mindfulness. It might be, you know, some form of, um, a craft or a hobby or exercise or a project around the house. Um, so I think that's exactly what what I would recommend. What can I do to kind of return back to this this moment right now? And the breathing is a very very um, common and effective way to do that. And I ha- and you know the mindfulness can look different for people. I would recommend breathing as an option. And, and at any point you can just pause and take a few deep breaths, uh-huh. um, and and that's effective. I think that um, you know you can just bring attention to any of your senses and you know, those, the breath, the senses, they're always in the present moment. So we have an opportunity here to just return back to this moment. And why is that important? Why is it important to drop into the 
body to the senses well because our mind is never in the present moment or very rarely is it in the present moment and when we do when we are confronted with a stressor it it kind of latches on to that and um, creates additional catastrophic stories and so um, if we come back to the breath to the body we distance ourselves from that often stressful narrative that we get caught up in during stressful times and so i think it can be really really effective um so you know they're yeah i'm just gonna say that that you know you're so right that the catastrophizing that you know i'm hearing more and learning more about is i can you know when this first started happening i thought well this is ridiculous what is the I don't, what is happening with toilet paper? What, what do people anticipate mm-hmm. is going to be happening? I don't understand. What, <laughs> and I thought, this is ridiculous. But then the more you start listening to people and reading things online and watching the news, it's a contagion effect. You, you, I do mm-hmm. start thinking, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't deposit this check. Maybe I should get this all in cash. Maybe I should, you know get barbed wire and put, and put it around the house. Maybe I should invest in a bunker. And I, and then I, then I step away and I think, Kim, you're being ridiculous. This like where 20 minutes ago, I was like, this, this, this is ridiculous. This is get, getting off the hook. But the, the mind does this, the catastrophes. It's so easy. I was so shocked at myself of how quickly I started, my head was nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I need to get toilet paper. <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's contagious. It's so true. It's so tr- I think you're absolutely right. I was at um, Costco last week, and, you know, everyone was looking at everyone else's cart to see what they were getting, and it, it, is, con- it is contagious. And so um, I think that we, you know, have to use our own tools to pull ourselves out of that. But, there, you know, there's an, there's a evolutionary component to this that if we can think about worst case scenarios then we can prepare Mm -hmm. but what happens in you know nowadays is that we think about those worst case scenarios and we think that they're um actually you know definitely going to happen inevitable and so inevitable and so if um and when that happens, of course, our stress response turns on and, and we have that same stress response as if we're actually in danger. And so that's where I think the mindfulness can kind of reel us back a little bit and say, okay, there's the catastrophic thinking. I was expecting you. And then to come back and settle into the to the breath. Um, so... Uh, and, and I think it's also important to point out that anxiety isn't isn't bad. You know, anyone would feel anxious during this time. You watch the news or you just talk to other people. So that's not a bad thing. I think part of um, the anxiety is, is actually quite helpful in motivating us to um, take precautionary measures and follow the guidelines but we we you know we start to see that the anxiety just as you said gets it increases and increases and increases and it kind of um uh, gets us to a state of panic and that's certainly right. not useful so what about what kind of you know what coping strategies have you um been sharing mm-hmm. with your patients and in your practice yeah um so one of the ones that i think is really helpful in a situation like this is, you know, note the facts of the present moment and drop the story. So the facts can be stressful enough. The facts are, you know, there is this virus or today I am um, stuck in the house or quarantined or, or you know, um, on the front lines, whatever it is, those are the facts and you can state those. But then notice how the mind just, again, attaches all those stories of, but what if this happens and what if that happens? And that's an opportunity to pause and say, okay, these are the facts. This is the only moment that's real. And while those catastrophes are possibilities, there's also a possibility, a larger possibility likelihood that those catastrophes won't happen many of the time. So, um, so I like those kind of phrases to um, note the facts and drop the story. Remember that this moment is the only reality. And then once you reel yourself back in to pause and take a few deep breaths. And if you can, 
do more than just a few deep breaths. That's terrific. You know, if you can pull up a guided meditation, um, the Calm app or Headspace or whatever apps people like, or just Googling it on um, YouTube and sitting and taking five minutes or 10 minutes, that can really make a big difference in terms of turning off that stress response. I've noticed also, the other thing I've noticed for myself over the past um, several days is how important it is to practice gratitude and to look for a silver lining. And I think, again, you know, our our minds are just um, flooded with kind of negativity right now. And, um, but, you know, a few times I've noticed I can pause and, for example, um, look at, look out the window and see the flowers blooming or Mm -hmm. connecting a little more closely with, with my children, whereas I, I normally would be trying to multitask and do a million different things. And so I think, you know, is there any beauty that we can look for in this moment and mm. just to begin to shift that uh, negativity of the brain? That is so important, Netta. I love that. And, and we're, we're all hearing stories of neighbors helping neighbors and communities coming together and, and just mm-hmm. um, people taking extra steps to look out for each other and sympathize and empathize and, and smile and that those kinds of things. Yeah, in, in times of stress, there are people who will at some times, you know, some of all, all of us may be afraid and run away and, and other people will, will step up and be kind and loving. And I think this is an opportunity for all of us to, as you're pointing out, just... Um, Focus on, on the good things that, uh, as you said, the, the spring bulbs, the, all my, my tulips are coming up and the daffodils are up. And I see moms and dads out in their little backyards in my row home here playing with their kids and and texting me, you know, we're going to the grocery store. Do you need anything? And so, mm. in, you know, in times mm-hmm. of uh, you know, a challenge like this, you know, the humanity of people taking care of each other um is is really right in our face. So you're you're so right to help us focus on. It's not all you know. It's not all panic. There is still some beauty and um, faith in humanity and people taking care of people. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, and I think you know then you can ask yourself you know what can I do to to help someone today? And it could be something little. Maybe you know you know an elderly person and you give them a phone call and just check in um, and. Um, and so I think, you know, that that's helpful for that person, but it's also helpful for us to feel connected. Yes. Um, and so, so that's another, I think, I think big one is, you know, we lost a lot of social connection yes. um, through some of this. And that is for many people, such a important component of their lives and well-being. And yeah. so you know, I think we do need to be creative about how we maintain that. And so, yes, we, you know, we um, are practicing social distancing. And so we can't spend this time uh, getting together with individuals like like we would. But, you know, can you set up a group um, Zoom call with friends or FaceTime? And mm-hmm. I'm doing doing that. So, you know, how can I be creative and still maintain my social social support? Can yeah. I do any of the activities online with uh, with with friends as if they're they're present but present yeah. virtually? It's, yeah, especially I was I was thinking, you know, folks like me who are off the chart extroverts, this kind mm-hmm. of social isolation and distancing, yeah. and and I'm a big hugger. So, like you, you mm. take someone like me who's an extrovert. And a hugger who lives alone, this is mm-hmm. you know potentially you know maddening, and so uh, yeah. I'm definitely you know I have to, as you kind of implied earlier, have a routine and a schedule where I know I'm not going to be able to sit down here in my basement and podcast by myself day in day out for who knows how long. So getting mm-hmm. outside, taking the garbage bag and some gloves, and picking up litter in my neighborhood. I'm exercising, I'm breathing air, I'm walking, I'm waving and talking to neighbors, appropriately distanced, but I'm also picking mm-hmm. up litter and garbage. So I was trying to you know, think of creative ways, as you said, too, like calling people. I'm not a big telephone talker, 
But, Mm -hmm. you know, I picked up my cell phone and actually called and spoke with someone on the phone, uh, you know, Linda Dillon Jones, you remember her dear friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just chatted with her for 20 minutes and ended up laughing and telling stories. And I hung up and I thought, well, geez, that felt pretty good. And then, of course, sharing all the silly memes with, you know, friends in the office and sisters and family. So that kind of silver lining of trying to maintain connection and community um, is it just you have to make sure you do it because it's too easy to sit here. I have, you know, a big stack of books. But for knowing that I'm an extrovert, I can only spend so much time alone reading quietly before I would get depressed and sad and start, you know, feeling, you know, mm-hmm. anxious. So I think recognizing mm-hmm. and knowing ourselves and knowing what we need and figuring out creative ways to do that, um, again, is some way of getting control of by, you know, making a plan, right? Absolutely. And I, yeah, I love that, that you did that, you know, that it doesn't have to be black and white, that you don't have to, you know, get together with a group of friends at a restaurant or, you know, um, uh, go down in your basement and read books the whole time that you can, you can still get out. You know, there was a, um, the, an email that came from my children's camp that said, uh, camp closed, nature open. Uh-huh. And I love that <laughs> because, you know, you can still go outside. You can, um, you can do things you wouldn't otherwise do, uh, that you wouldn't have time for, but just even seeing that other people are out, yeah. even if, you know, if they're a distance away, I think makes a really important, important difference. That's right. And you can call me anytime. Yeah, as well. Add me, add me to your list. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, um, this has been it's a, a great conversation. I think it's a nice little um, reminder of all of us. I love your uh, this mantra: note the facts, drop the story. So maybe mm-hmm. we can um, kind of keep that in the in the back of our heads as everybody um, gets through these uh, these challenging times. Again, note the facts. Drop the story. You've been listening to and learning from Dr. Netta Gould, the director of the mindfulness program right here at Johns Hopkins, the associate director of the Bayview Anxiety Disorders Clinic in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Oh, and I forgot to tell you earlier, she is a recent inductee in the Miller Coulson Academy of Clinical Excellence. So, folks, this is a clinically excellent faculty member you've been learning from, a very prestigious, competitive society here at Johns Hopkins. So Netta, thank you so much for taking time. I know you're seeing patients and doing therapy remotely and doing everything online. So thank you for everything you're doing for our patients and for us here on the podcast. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure, Kim. All right. Take care, everybody out there. Till next time. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.